I've uh, been working for, for Clarify Analytics, uh, formerly Thompson Reuters, and before that, ISI, for almost 40 years. So I worked uh, for Dr. Garfield back in the 1980s and produced all of our print products, and I was also an indexer. So I, I'm very familiar with the content. I actually did some editorial work on our, our, on our data, selecting the social sciences and arts and humanities publications as well. So I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I want to first, before we get started with this presentation, just uh, to, to announce that uh, all research institutes and universities in Ukraine will now have access to the Web of Science data. And that's a very exciting thing for the country. And you join a network of countries across Europe. I believe there are 22 countries in Europe that have national access to the Web of Science. And then also there are uh, Latin America, as well as Australia, New Zealand, Canada. So to join a network of users, about 20 million users on any given day access to the Web of Science. So it's a very exciting thing. And uh, I, I, I wish you continued success using the product. So I'm going to talk about the Web of Science, the content and tools, uh, and how uh, what, what, what we've been doing in, in, the, in the last year or two. Uh, when I, before I get started, though, um, just to give you an introduction and to talk about uh, our foundation and our citation content. And content is very, very valuable for us. And then also to announce, and you probably have seen, if you follow our website, uh, you've seen that we re-established ISI as part of our company, which is very exciting for me because I came from that. And uh, it's exciting because it is involved in research and discovery for the academic research community, doing a lot of important things, including events, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, very soon. I want to talk about open access and visibility. We'll just talk about open access. And we uh, have positioned ourselves. We're very neutral, obviously. We select journals from all over the world. Uh, but we've also integrated open access into our platform in a way that's very unique. And we were the first platform to do so. Um, I want to talk about uh, some tools for the research uh, researcher, one of which is called Capernio. Another is called Publogs. I'm not going to talk about Publogs too much because someone else is going to talk about that separately, so I'll just introduce it. And then also about analytics, because um, our company is called Clara Analytics, and as, as an analytics company, we are at the forefront of, of metrics development. We have something called the JCR, which is Journal Citation Reports, which you have access to. It is the world's uh, most trusted research tool for evaluation of journals, and it's used by almost 2,000 research universities in the world. Um, so let's get started. Um, over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of change uh, in, in our company, and uh, we changed the name to Clarivate Analytics, and within Clarivate Analytics, we're now called uh, the Web Science Group. Um, two years ago, we announced that Annette Thomas would come on as our CEO. Annette comes from a publishing background. She was at, she brought Nature from one publication up to 60, and she also founded Digital Science, so, so that's uh, very, very key. And she has a, a, a background. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to have at the head of our company, someone who has walked in the shoes of researchers because she has done research, She's a cell biologist, and then also she understands publishing and what researchers need. So that's very exciting news. I mentioned ISI as part of what we're doing, and that's exciting for all of us. I will, you've seen, I hope, some reports that have been issued by ISI uh, on our website, and they're, they're, they're located, I'll, I'll show you them, uh, one or two of them in this presentation. And then also, um, we are honoring Dr. Garfield, uh, both his legacy uh, for 65 years that he founded the company 65 years ago, ISI, and then also uh, we, we have set up a citation award that will be announced at the International Scientometrics Conference in Rome. It's the third year of the award, and it pr promotes research and development in, in using citation analysis for younger researchers, researchers who are the first 
first decade of their careers. And that's very exciting as well. So on the team leading our company, though, in addition to Annette, we have brought in a group of people of vast experience. And they're, uh, they're, they're at the forefront or leading different parts of our company. And they all have experience working in that area. So it's very, very key. One of which I want to point out is Jan Reichelt. And Jan found that he's the managing director of the Web of Science. So he, he brought Mendeley to the market. Uh, uh, he founded Mendeley, and he is doing a lot of exciting things for the Web of Science, some of which I'm going to talk about. But you see in front of you a group of people who, who have vast experience in, in research and development. Doing research, uh, in academic research. So that it's very exciting for us because our company is moving forward in, a, in all different areas. But we have a legacy, and that legacy is with Dr. Garfield, and that he founded this company in 1955, 58 actually, when current contents came into being. In 1955, he wrote a paper in Science Magazine, in the Journal of Science, and wrote about using citations through the Association of Ideas to find additional papers. And at the time, people thought it was a crazy idea, but it has become the, the standard in, in research and also in scientific research for cit citation analysis. So we owe a great debt to him, and everything that we do is based on his principles of, of accuracy, completeness, and consistency, and that's a very good thing. And he brought to the, to the forefront uh, over a period of, uh, he died two years ago, he died in 2016, uh, about two and a half years ago, and he was still with our company as uh, sort of a, uh, an emeritus president of the company and very active in organizations, but he brought, we have a long history of research and development and bringing important resources to, to the research community. And that's a very, very critical thing. And you see on this timeline just uh, some of the important things that have happened in our company. So we developed our database from the start to cover the most important literature published in the world, the high impact literature of the sciences, social sciences, and arts and humanities. And the Web of Science has brought these all together in one resource. And that really promotes Dr. Garfield's idea of cross discipl disciplines crossing boundaries in a way that never before could be done because you have different resources, the sciences, social sciences, and arts and humanities. Now you have them all together in one resource. And we've added a lot to that as well, and I'm going to talk about that. This is a picture of the research flow, and it's a very complex picture. I, I'm not going to ask you to, to look at that because it would take a lot of time to go through that. But essentially, our tools and services promote every act, every point around that circle, from, from getting a grant for funding your research, for doing your research and development, for promoting your research, publishing your research, and then also for benchmarking, for measuring your research uh, at the university. So the tools were designing, and you see a list of them on the right side of the screen, uh, the Web of Science uh, EndNote, which helps, which is integrated in our platform in a way that allows you to create libraries of important research of uh, papers or manuscripts or that, you, that you're developing, uh, but also insights for benchmarking and, and analytics. Uh, we have the journal citation reports, as well as something called Scholar One for publishing, and then also we have a research management system called Kibera. So our, our services extend across the entire research ecosystem. And we, we are adding things to every, every point of access to make it more efficient and effective for you. So at the center of our platform, though, is the Web of Science. And the Web of Science it, Foundation is in the center of that circle. The platform is it's a huge platform and it has resources that have specialist resources in the patents. We have something called, which we just talked about, open data and open science, 
We have something called the data citation index. Uh, the data citation index uh, is a resource, and I look at it much like Dr. Garfield developed current contents back in 1958. He brought to, nothing existed at the time, and he brought all of the most important journals together so that you could search across them. This is a journal, uh, this is data repositories, data sets, and data studies. We talked about uh, data uh, the repositories just in the last presentation. This brings the important repositories together and creates a search across them and a resource that is connected to the journal literature, the patent literature, the conference proceedings literature. So in a sense, it's the same uh, idea as the web of science, but it extends it to big data. And it's up on our platform, and we are indexing we're selected repositories. We've identified 1,500. We've, uh, we have, have agreements with over 600 repositories at this point. We're getting a data feed from each of them and indexing it. So it's a very important new source of information. And it puts us really at the forefront of open science because uh, it, it, it allows you to search across this information in a way that's not available. Much of these repositories, many of these repositories are open, but you have nothing that searches across all of them. And we're indexing them and adding value by creating an author's, the author's, the title for the data set. Uh, we're actually having to have the references to the data set, and we've integrated those into the web of science as well. But the, the platform itself has, in total, 34,000 journals, so it's a very large platform. Specialist content as well as the multidisciplinary content. And I'm going to talk about the Web of Science very, uh, mostly. Um, the Web of Science core collection, which is what you have access to. Um, it covers about 21,000 journals altogether, and they are multidisciplinary, covering the sciences, social sciences, arts and humanities. Uh, also, we have conference literature, conference proceedings literature, and, and books on the platform. Uh, influential content, high quality content. Uh, and we've expanded our content, I'm going to talk about that separately, into something called the Emerging Sources Citation Index. Um, but the selection of our content has always been very, very key. It's been careful analysis of what we need to cover. Dr. Garfield wrote back in the 70s that, you know, the high impact literature of, of, a, of a discipline is approximately the, the core literature, 2,000 titles in, every, in any one discipline. But the 2,000 will change over time. And our, our goal is to cover all of the most critical literature in the sciences, social sciences, and arts and humanities. So we have about 74 million records altogether, including the Emerging Sources Citation Index at this point. Uh, it's a large database. And the, at the hallmark of it is the selection. So we have uh, our own editors that do nothing but select the content, working with over 4,000 publishers all over the world. We have a group of people in Philadelphia, as well as a group of people in Barcelona, and adjunct miscellaneous people who are working on selection in different countries. Because as one would know, publishing is different in different countries. Sometimes it's national, sometimes it's, uh, it, it's it, individual private publishers. And these selection people, right, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because we're going to talk about it separately. But they have no affiliation and are not allowed to publish papers on their own because it can be construed as a conflict of interest. So we remain neutral and objective. The publishing model, open access, subscription, new methods, it doesn't matter. It has to be high quality material. So after we select it, then it's indexed comprehensively. And this, this You'll get a copy of these slides. <laughs> but this, this picture gives you really a picture of the source data of, 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 of the authors. All of the authors are indexed. All of the author affiliations are indexed, no matter how many are there. And we, we standardize that data so you can search across time. Um, all of uh, the funding information from 
from 2008 forward is, is included. And we've standardized about 12,000 publisher, no, excuse me, uh, about 1,200 funders at this point. And we're moving forward to standardize more funders going forward so you'll be able to search them in the web of science. And, and at the hallmark of our platform, obviously, is the citation network. Moving forward and backward through time. Beginning with the seminal work in your discipline and moving forward all the way to the current week, or even the current day, because Web of Science is loaded daily now, five times a week, to find who's using that and taking that information, that idea forward in a new area. And you can go backwards in time and, and span all the way back to the first mention of a, of, a, of a subject. And the idea of the citation index really is novel because the subject terminology will change uh, to describe the subject. It's, it's described differently by different countries, but the citations will take you to all of the information because they do not change, and that's, that's very important. So we do unification. The author affiliations are unified into something we call organization enhanced. And this is where we have over 12,000 uh, unified uh, authors of uh, organizations. Uh, we have produced almost a million rules to unify. We work, we work with our customers to unify the data. And we have 1,200 funders that are now unified on the platform as well. So the web of science is moving forward quickly. To, we're transforming the web of science into uh, to, to improve discovery and access of the high quality content. Uh, we're developing things for researchers to make, to, to help them up along their, their quest for research because it is a path they have to follow and we're giving them new tools to make it easier. And we've integrated OA, open access, into the platform because we don't want you to have barriers. We, we know that researchers want to get to the paper, the full text. And we've integrated that into the platform. Um, and we have uh, also developed new ways of taking the data out of the web of science using modern APIs. APIs are simply uh, a way to come into the back door of the web of science and take larger amounts of data. Excuse me. Very well. So this is just a really a, a quick summary of some of the things we've done, and I want to point out a couple of things. So on the right side of the screen, uh, we've integrated uh, some things that are unique to us. Um, we do comprehensive indexing, cover-to-cover -cover indexing. Every substantive, important paper in a journal is, is included from issue to issue. We, we all the cited references, 1.6 billion, over 1.6 billion in total. We have, in a typical year, we do almost 80 million references. Uh, we're indexing them. And they are indexed. They're not reported to the content. They are indexed according to standardized rules. And the indexing to learn how to do it, because I have learned uh, in 1980, it hasn't, it's changed tremendously, but what we do is not changed because we have to make things searchable across time. But, but it takes six months to a year to learn how to do this. Um, but this is just uh, sort of a, 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 a summary of what we've done over the past year. And you see that we're loading Web of Science daily. We're also, uh, uh, we have something called early access, which is very important. And by the end of this year, we'll have uh, almost 3,500 titles. So we'll be getting the information as soon as the publisher releases the article, not waiting for the article to be put into an issue. So it's going to get into the content much, much earlier. So this, and for researchers also, we, we've built into a browser in Chrome that you don't even have to open the web science to use it. You don't have to disturb your flow of research if you're on the internet. You can just click on the little icon in your toolbar uh, on your computer, open the web of it, it opens a little browser, plug in, and you can search the web of science. It knows who you are. So, it, it, and everyone can have that. Up on our website, there is information about how to do that. So, now let's talk about the Emerging Sources Citation Index a little bit. 
because um, researchers teach our, our data, we studied our data. Uh, when we did the uh, retrospective data, going back to 1900, we studied what was being cited. Um, but in the current data over the past, over the past 10 years or so, we've seen an explosion, an exponential growth in the, in the collaboration between countries. And this got us thinking about what we needed to do to expand our, our content. So we working with uh, key customers all over the world, we identified uh, 13,000 journals that we needed to take a look at. And we look at each one of them. So our editors created a source called the Emerging Sources Citation Index that came out in 2015. And it covers, at this point, it covers 7,600, 7, titles. So they've been identified from among the regional published journals in the world. And they're not North American by any means. They're, they're coming from many, many, many different countries. Why did we do this? Well, you can see in our data that, that most of the time, you know, research, researchers from the Ukraine are working with different Researchers are working with people in China, in the United States. Uh, so, and, and once they work with them, then they are, they're becoming known. And what the other things that they're doing are, are just important. They become more important. So we, we needed to select that content, being very careful about what we select. But to select that content, and we've done that, increasing the website by 7,680 journals about 3 million records or articles, and uh, almost 70 million cited references. And a, a total of 2,745, 2,745 titles are DOAJ titles. They are fully open access, so everyone gets those papers. So it, it expands research into emerging areas of science. Think about social sciences and arts and humanities. Things are studied differently in different countries, as something that is culturally important here may be written about more than it is in the United States. And the publications coming out of that are important, whether they're, you know, they're published here. So we needed to focus our attention on that coverage. And when we did that, we, we picked 7,680 titles. 37% of those titles are from the social sciences, so it expands the social sciences almost up to 8,000 titles with the SSCI, with the Social Sciences Citation Index. 16% of those titles were from the arts and humanities. Uh, and that very clearly gives the content of boosts in the humanities, up to around 3,000 titles. Um, the records uh, between, we've also added an archive, a 10-year archive from 2014 back to 2005, because we knew that in benchmarking and analytics, which this data is very important for you to be able to measure researchers over time, that we needed at least a 10-year archive. Our customers told us that. So we went back to 2005 and added content from 2005 to 2014. Uh, and most of the, a, a, a large percentage, 39% of the, uh, the papers are openly available. So you see, category by category here, what we've added. But even in the sciences, you see in clinical medicine, I think it, the number was about 1,200, 1,250 titles. So it's adding important science as well, not just social sciences and humanities. And you see uh, that social science is added the most, and it brings it up to, it's, it's about 7,500 now. This, this graph is a little old. Uh, and the arts and humanities almost up to 3,000 titles. And you see where that content is coming from all over the world. It's not North American centric, it's not Anglo centric at all. It's coming from the countries all over the world. In uh, Korea, 133 titles. Uh, from uh, Europe, 3,713 titles are coming from Europe, the, the EU 29 countries. So that's very, that's very good. Uh, for the Middle East and Northern Africa, 326 titles. We're looking for your help. This is not a static file, by the way. Uh, we will add additional content. 
We will keep going. We will be very, very selective. Our goal is to select high quality content that suits the audience of the users of the web of science in that discipline. So it has to add to the, to the discipline, and we have to be able to index the content because we're doing the same standardized indexing, complete indexing of the content with all cited references. Uh, and as I said, we've added the archive, the 10-year archive. It's about 2 million records that were added. And you see how that adds to each year in the Emerging Sources Citation Index. And altogether, uh, uh, you know, the 10-year archive represents about 59% of the total records in the Emerging Sources Citation Index. And what effect is this having on journals? Well, the publishers of these journals, number one, their publications are being cited more. Over 200 titles have moved from the Emerging Sources Citation Index up into the Sciences, Social Sciences, and Arts and Humanities edition. So that's a very good thing because the network of 20 million people using the Web of Science on any given day is looking at that, this paper, these papers and they're citing them. So you see just an example of that from a humanities title from the time that we added Emerging Sources how the citations started going up. And then obviously the more current, current papers can't be cited because they haven't been on the database long enough. And it takes a while to become cited. But when you see this, there's a jump in papers. And the publishers have told us that uh, they're getting more manuscripts as a result of being selected for the web science, <laughs> and they're getting a higher quality of manuscript. And we, are, we work with journal editors, uh, in the region as well, to helping them, uh, you know, determine, you know, how, what is important, what we're looking for to select their publications. And again, uh, uh, Valentin is going to talk about selection, so I don't want to talk about it too much. ISI. ISI has come back, to, it's sort of like back to the future for, for me, because I was there in its heyday, and we've reestablished ISI as part of the Web, web of Science group. So in the 70s and 80s, Dr. Garfield wrote the research and development. He, he did a group of essays that were published in Current Comments called Current Comments. And they are available now, freely available, up on the website. So you can search them even by title work, but you can, you can download them as well. So, and they're, they're, they're very, very good essays because a lot of the things that he wrote about in the 70s, we're still talking about uh, uh, today about the misuse of the data, in particular the, journals, the, the journal impact factor. In 1977, he wrote a paper, current, an essay, about the misuse of the journal impact factor. And today, we still have that. So uh, he was very, very, very smart, and what, 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 you know, and, and, but he believed in basic research for our company, that it helped us create better products, it helped us work with the, the academic research community, and that was very, very important for us. So ISI maintains a corpus of knowledge around metrics. They're going to help us determine what new metrics we, we should add to the platform. And we're looking at that today. We're going to come out with some new metrics across all of the content, including the humanities. That's, that's in the works. I'm not sure when it will happen, but it will happen. And we're looking at that very keenly for, for the coming year. Um, they also, ISI disseminates research reports, um, and they are our knowledge base centrally to help us determine what we should do. They're looking at editorial things. They're looking at our editorial coverage to, to look at using, using uh, uh, data science to look at all of the material that we cover across time to determine, you know, where disciplines, maybe we should concentrate a little bit more on the discipline. They're helping us in many, many ways. And they carry out research and actually uh, they are hosting many events for us. ISI will be at the ISI conference. All of the uh, research, uh, the, the, the insights, uh, research analytics forums that we have to hold ISI is hosting those as well. So, we've reestablished ISI to disseminate that knowledge to the academic research community. It's 
very important for us. Dr. Garfield back in the 80s, 70s, and 80s. I was started in 1980, but I met people from all over the world because they would come. I, I was part of a group that had an enormous research library, and nothing was online at that time. So they would all convene in my group to use our dictionary reference works. So uh, I met people from all over the world, and that was important to Dr. Garfield, to bring people in to do academic research and to make that thing available to everyone. And we're going to do that again. This is uh, the first three reports that were issued by MSI. The first on the left is called Profiles, Not Metrics. And these are all available up on our website, so you can go to our website and download a copy of these. Uh, the second was the Plan S Footprint. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. Uh, but it is uh, looking at our data at, as far as how Plan S and how, that, how those organizations have signed, that have signed on for Plan S, how the, their funding uh, relates to open access versus non-open access and citation analysis of that data as well. And then the, the recent report that came out was navigating the structure of research on sustainable development goals. Um, so uh, as everyone knows, we're, we, there are many, many crises in the world today, you know, climate, all, all different types of things. And uh, this report uses our data to focus in on 12 key issues that have been reported. And it, it's a very interesting read, so I recommend taking a look at it. I mentioned this, this, this commitment to research. Uh, we have the awards for Dr. Honor and Dr. Garfield, and this is a link to that. Anyone, we're taking applications for that, so if there are researchers in the region that uh, are 10 years, if within 10 years of the beginning of their research careers, they can apply for this, and all they need to do is to submit a, a, a document that describes their research, what they intend to do with an abstract, and the research uh, ISI will be looking at all the research applicants and will we'll, we'll select the winner. The winner attends ISI this year in Rome and will be honored at the conference. Um, so that's very, very key for us as well. So Plan S. Um, I don't know how much you know about Plan S, but it is a open access movement uh, where uh, a group of funders have signed on to a plan that says that they will that in order to get funding from them, your research has to be published in an open access publication. So there's a lot of controversy about this because some researchers say it limits where they can publish, you know, and what does it mean over time? Um, and it's just beginning to take hold. So what we did is we looked at a report to look at our data. To, to present an unbiased view of what's happening today. Using 2017 data, we went in and took a look at the signatories. These are funders that have signed on to this, uh, and they're from all over the world. Uh, and what we did is we looked at our 2017 data very quickly and looked at the papers that were funded by the organizations that have signed on to Plan S. And you see at the top, the European Union, they publish more papers than anyone. But it goes down the scale, all the way down. And these are important, uh, important organizations. The National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation have yet to sign on to this. They probably will soon in the United States. Uh, now, it's very hard to mandate this. Uh, they've signed on to it, but how they, how they uh, manage this is another thing. Together. So this is a view of those papers that I showed you uh, and whether they're being published in open access journals. So you see the papers that were funded by these organizations and then you see on this bar graph where they're being published. The gray indicates non-open access. Over to the left you have the fully DOAJ journals. So the journal is openly available. In the center, you have the blue, which is hybrid, hybrid, or hybrid goal access, where uh, an article is uh, published in an open access, uh, open access, but in a subscription journal, the, the university or author, someone is paying 
processing charges for that. And then you see uh, free to read in the center. And then the green indicates the green open access, both uh, published and accepted, where they've been published in the repository. So you see, uh, at the center, the European Union, which publishes the most, is still 50, over 50% 50 in subscription journals. This is looking at that same, those same articles. So there's a lot of work to be done to really make this take effect. And it's created a lot of conflict for people because uh, researchers have agreed that it will limit where they can publish. They get a lot of money and grants from these organizations, certainly. So let's take a look at where these papers are cited. So we looked at the uh, essential science indicators uh, data categories. Central science indicators are, are broader categories you know, that we have on the platform uh, that 21 in the sciences and one general social sciences categories. And we looked at all papers in the category and their citations versus the, the open access by each of these uh, open access papers on these plan S, uh, uh, the people, the organizations that have signed uh, up for the Plan S. And you see that the Plan S papers, uh, the open papers, are being cited in every category more. So that's, that's an interesting thing. So it's a, that movement to open access is really creating uh, more citations for, for these papers as well. And then we look at, we look at you know, the 200 houses, the publishers that we're dealing with, the top 200. And you see on the y-axis, it is a percentage of plan S as a percentage of total papers. So you see the publishers listed, and on the bottom you see plan S papers and DOA journals. So it gives you sort of a look at where the publishers are positioned in all of this. We're very, uh, I always say, publisher neutral. So we're reflecting what's happening in our data. So we won't. You know, whatever, whatever occurs as a result of Plan S, we will continue to, to select the content very, very carefully. It has to meet what we're doing, whether it's open access or non-open access. But it's interesting to look at the data to, to see what's happening as well. And we'll, we'll update this plan over time as well. So a little bit more about open access uh, quickly. Um, you know, it's the DOA journals in web of science, um, we cover about 4,000 journals altogether on the platform, 4,200 or so. Uh, about 3,300 of those are covered in the Web of Science Core Collection. Um, so those are papers are openly available to everyone because the journal is open access. Um, but there's a lot of other open access articles and green open access, you know, gold open access, uh, bronze open access where publishers allow a read-only copy to be on their, on their own website to be accessed for reading. Um, so what we did is we looked at this very carefully. And up on the screen you see, you know, 50% of the papers are openly available. Uh, studies have been done that say 50% of all papers, they're not coming from just the DOA journals, but their 50% of the papers are openly available if you can get to them. Uh, there are 11,000 total gold open journals. We cover just you know, 40, 45 percent of them, uh, and we're looking at them very carefully as they are produced. Uh, there are over 100 OA publishing mandates. Uh, this is from an article from uh, a science, uh, was published by Eric Archambault from Science Metrics. Um, there are over 5,000 institutional repositories at this point. And to get funding from your university, uh, you, you sometimes have to deposit a copy of it in, 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 of your paper because the university is funding it. Um, and uh, that's hard to do as well because universities don't have an easy way for researchers to do that. And then you have 420,000 papers published in predatory open access journal journals uh, or, or articles. So the, 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 the paper is, is uh, in some ways not legitimate because the science behind it is, uh, is predatory. Uh, and what we've done is we've developed Web of Science to include something, uh, there was a company, uh, a small not-for-profit company, or a 
organization called Impact Story. And it's two people, actually. And uh, they were very uh, um, much uh, open access uh, promoters. And they had something called the Unpaid Wall that they developed. And what we did is we invested in their algorithm so that we gave them the web design's content and said, we want to link out to all the legitimate copies of papers, the green published, the green accepted in a repository, the bronze where the publisher says you can read it, and then also obviously the hybrid goal. So when we did that, you know, we created a, a resource that is unique because it's the first uh, multidisciplinary citation database with across the board all, all types of open access, legitimate papers. Now we have relationships with 4,000 over 4,000 publishers, so we cannot link to uh, content that is coming from a place that is illegal. Uh, so we're very careful. That algorithm is refined, so it does not do that. Uh, and what this did, though, was increase the web of science scope of, of articles from 2.1 million in the DOAJ journals to over 12 million papers. And that is updated every week. We're giving Impact Story a data feed from the Web of Science Weekly. They are running their algorithm against that data and giving us back the data with the type of open access for each, for when the paper is open access. And that is going into the Web of Science as quickly as possible. That's done weekly. So that's a very key thing. For, for researchers. Now, I looked at you know the Ukraine very quickly. Uh, I looked at the publications for the Ukraine and then filtered uh, by open access. And, and you see there are 33,903 papers that are openly available in all editions of the Web of Science before collection. Uh, the journal literature, the uh, science, social sciences, arts, humanities, and emerging sources of the 100 and approximately 100. 70,000 papers. So, so um, that's, you know, well, that's like 20, 22% or so of the papers are openly available at this point, uh, total papers. If we look at ESCI, the Emerging Sources Citation Index, um, you see that 17,000 of the papers, and in the ESCI, I think there were like 39,000 papers altogether for, for, for the Ukraine. Uh, for published by researchers from Ukraine. And you see that 17, uh, 13,000 of those are in open journals. So this, this highlights your research where others can get to it as well. And I looked at the categories of the open access very clearly. And you see hospitality and leisure sport, tourism, uh, and then you have education and educational research, which was the biggest category that the emergency Sources Citation Index produced, but you see sciences, social sciences, and humanities, so you're publishing in all of these categories. So full text, um, I want to introduce something to you. Uh, full text has always been, you know, to get to full text, it's always been a number of researchers sometimes have to go two or three different clicks to find the full text paper. Even on our platform, there was sometimes you go to the full text, we tried to have uh, from the paper to the paper link. Uh, but sometimes publishers would make you go to the opening of the, of the journal site and then find the paper. Um, so, so we have, uh, we acquired a small company called Pernio uh, about a year and a half ago, about a year ago or so, and, and, and integrated that into the web of science. Capernio was already integrated in Google Scholar PubMed, so it was already known. And what it does is it allows the researcher to travel with his library. So you read, it's free, number one. Capernio is free for individuals, so you can just type in Capernio or go to our website, or through the Web of Science, you can, it'll say sign up for Capernio, you click there, and you give yourself a username and password, and you're there. And Capernio will appear on the Web Science page, and it will lead you to full text. It defaults to your library resources. 
So if you have subscriptions in your library, it actually defaults to those first because you've paid for those. It's a return on your investment in the library. If it doesn't find a subscription, then it goes out looking for open access versions of that paper. And then finally, if it doesn't find the open access, it will search preprint servers and bring back that. And it brings it back in your locker. You have what is called a permio locker, where you can store the full text. You don't have to manage it right away. You can put it in your locker. And, and you have a, a, a certain amount of space that your researcher gets to store the papers. Uh, so it's very, very valuable because it, it, it travels with the researcher. You may be doing research in the web of science outside of the university and you don't have access to your university subs subscriptions. This gives you that. And it allows you to not only find your subscriptions, but also to, to get an open access version of the paper or to get a preprint. So it's very valuable and it returns uh, the library resources, it, 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 the investment that you're making for full text, it, it, it actually gives you a return on that investment. And it always tries to source the paper from the publisher website as well. And that's very critical. You see a picture of this. This, this is the Copernium button. It's going to move up into the page of the Web of Science very soon so that it's not so big. But it actually, you click there, all you do is go sign up from Capernio and you've got it from that point forward. So it helps researchers because it's point of need, access to full text no matter where you are. Uh, it also gives you open access and preprints. For institutions, it returns on your investment in, 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 in full text. And then finally for publishers, we're defaulting to the publisher of copy, so it's providing them with more eyes on their copy as well. And we're integrating this with EndNote. So you can download the bibliographic information and the full text in the same place, in one place. And that's going to very soon be integrated also on Mendeley and Zotero. So, so that's coming as well. It, it's actually there for EndNote. And also in the Web of Science, coming very soon, you're going to see this has cited 341 times, and that is how it is linked. So in the web of science, this is probably not that valuable because you have that on the record anyway. But using the web, using the Pernia outside of the web of science, it's going to link into the web of science from outside. So it's going to return, it's going to give you important ways of looking at the, the citing papers of a paper when you're working outside of the web of science as well. And that's coming in the near future. And then finally, uh, Copernio is going to have a dashboard. Um, you know, uh, it's very important to the libraries, you know, what are your researchers using? So you would see by publisher the number of times they're going out and clicking on full text, the number of times they're going to OA, the number of times they're going to preprints, and you see you get a publisher, sort of like a, a, a bar, bar chart of each publisher, with, and the colors indicate the different types of uh, links whether it's open access preprint or going to the full text the publisher site. And that's critical for libraries very much. Um, obviously, this only makes sense if enough of your researchers have downloaded the Copernium plugin. So we're, we, we're promoting that through educational seminars as well. So, pub lots. I'm going to speak very quickly about this because it's going to be talked about separately. Um, Publons has been very active in peer review. It was a company we acquired two years ago. It, uh, it was very important, uh, uh, really a very small company. But its, it's claim to fame was two things, really. It gave credit for peer review, for transparency, for, for legitimate peer review. Uh, as part of an academic career, every researcher has to do peer review. If you're on the faculty, you'll be asked to View. Um, uh, and so it gives you credit for that. And what we've done is we've, we've taken researcher ID and sort of integrated it with peer review. So you see a researcher's overall activity. And that's going to be presented in a few minutes, so I won't talk about that. But the important thing is also, Pumplons uh, also produces something called the Global Safety Peer Review. 
And the newest report has just been uh, announced that it will be available on our website as well. So that's very uh, important. And also, um, there's an academy which it teaches younger people who are at the beginning of their career how to do peer review. It is an online course that it has 10 modules and there are examinations. And at the end of that, you get a certificate which can be put up on your own website that you are a legitimate peer review, uh, credit, accredited peer reviewer. So publishers will, will know that because they're using publons to find reviewers. Uh, a lot of the major publishers have signed up to use publons, uh, something called Reviewer Connect, as part of their peer review process, where they search uh, the, 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 for peer reviews, and then they also use the web science to search for the peer review. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. I'll leave it for, for a minute to talk about. Uh, but we are integrating this into the web science author record as well. And that's the important thing about this, in my, in my view, because I'm a web science guy. Um, but there's going to be a new web science search, and every researcher that publishes a paper in the web of science will be invited through, through his email address, his or her email address being in that paper, will be invited to, to create a profile uh, automatically. So it's going to be something we're going to do. So it's our way of creating the old researcher ID, and it's renamed now Web of Science Researcher ID. It's part of Publons. So that's a very important thing. And that's happening very soon. In fact, by the end of July, the first version of that will be coming out. And it will give an author identifier to every published author if the author signs up. So analytics, as I said, clarity analytics. So analytics is at the forefront of what we do. In the 80s, we were the company that created co-citation clustering, which became a part of all of custom analytics and bibliometrics and looking at creating maps of science. And Dr. Henry Small, as part of working for Dr. Garfield, created you know, uh, a way of looking at the data uh, using the web science data. But today we have a, a, a great many resources that, and one of them is called Insights Benchmarking. So I'll talk about that just a little bit. Uh, we have APIs which give a researcher a large, you may want to do a research landscape analysis. What is happening to a topic over time? Pulling down the papers from the web science would be difficult because you would need thousands of papers to do this. All right, uh, we will continue. Um, I, I stopped at a good place to talk about analytics. And Clarity Analytics was at the forefront of the production of metrics back in the 1980s, and we continue to be at the forefront. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these resources, Insights Benchmarking and Analytics, uh, talk about APIs in particular, and then touch upon a couple of different things. <clears throat> Insights Benchmarking and Analytics. Uh, for universities that need to measure their researchers, to look at their organization and, and, and peer organizations in, in your country and then outside your country to find collaborators to measure the impact of the collaboration, the funding collaboration. Uh, Insights of being a benchmark analytics allows you to do that. So very valuable. It gives you the ability to run reports. And this is a data set that's updated monthly. It includes the content from the Web of Science platform, all, all the editions, the core collection, so books, proceedings, as well as journals, and the journals with the sciences, social sciences, arts and humanities, and, and, and also the emerging sources. And it goes back, it starts in 1980, so you get the data from 1980 forward. And it also includes uh, uh, the way to do some valuable reporting. You can do bibliometric analysis on productivity, you know, number of papers, but also on impact, you know, how many citations per paper, how many citations in comparison to other papers published in that same journal, uh, other original articles in that same journal, uh, in the category, where does your research uh, rate or, or how does it compare to, to other research published in the category. 
Uh, you can also do open access studies, because we've integrated open access into, into Insights Benchmarking and Analytics. And we're going to, this by the end of the year, we're going to have a new version of Insights, and it's going to give you all the different types of open access as well. So it will allow you to look at what you're funding, you know, if you're paying article processing charges at the university, it will let you look at how that data is being used by others. We're also going to integrate citing papers into, into Insights b and as well. So you have a way to not only analyze uh, your productivity versus other, other universities that, that may be peer universities in Ukraine and across Europe, and we have standardized the data for 12,800 uh, no, yes, 12, universities. So they all appear in Insights b &A. Uh, and you can look at them by organization and by discipline as well. Um, you also have pre-built reports, so it's very easy to use, that allow you to look at your university and other universities. And also there's something in there called the uh, Local Journal Mobilization Report. So it gives you a sense of the web assigns content, where you're publishing the top 10 journals, and what you're citing. And who, what others are citing you. It gives you a listing of the organizations that are citing your, your published works as well. So it's a quick way in a system report. You don't have to, you don't have to create the report, you just put it in the university name and you get that. So for collection management and for looking at what your university is doing, it's a very easy way. And it's also integrated, with, Insights is integrated with, with Web of Science. When I uh, looked at Ukraine, uh, I'm attending the conference tomorrow, I looked at Ukraine and I created open access data sets for Gold OA, other Gold OA, uh, Green OA, Green Published and Green Accepted OA for the Ukraine and then looked at how they compare as far as impact and the number of papers and how they appear versus the category. So we create something called the Category Normalized Citation that allows you to look at the papers you've published in the category, in, the, in all the categories you've published in. And then what it does is that for each paper, it, it, it uh, creates a, a metric that is based on the standard for that category. So remember, we, we do cover to cover indexing of all the journals. So for the category of journals, we have all the original papers, and we know what is the average time cited for a paper published in this category in this year. And then we build a ratio of your papers to that, that, that standard threshold. And it gives you a sense of where you rate within the category. We've integrated JCR to this as well, so you can see uh, how many papers you're publishing in the, in the top quartile, the second quartile, the third quartile, and the fourth quartile. So it gives you the, uh, the ability to look at your organization very uniquely. Um, APIs, very clearly. Um, users want to do uh, large-scale research reports. They want to look at horizon scanning or looking at the landscape and say, how is this topic, uh, who's publishing in this topic every five, and look at it every five years over a period of 20 years, 20, 30 years. And when you do that, you need to pull down larger amounts of data. The web of science is limited, really designed for personal research, for somebody to write a paper, but not for that mammoth research project that you might be doing. And so we have built these APIs that allow you to pull down larger amounts of data. And we entitle you for this service. And we have scripts built where you can just put in your university name or the topic that you're searching and it will pull back the papers. So this is something that you know, we can talk about. As you gain uh, access and you're using the web of science more, your researchers may want to take advantage of this uh, and, and can, can be discussed with faculty and, and uh, people here in, in, in the country. Um, also, if you have any type of database, we have something called, uh, you can put the time side account in it, and it's very easy to do. It allows you for any database that you may have created, uh, let's say the discipline of uh, biomedical studies has a separate database that they've created um, of papers that, that people, uh, faculty and researchers in that discipline 
have published. Um, you can take those papers and push them into the Web of Science, and it will take the, the author, the title of the paper, the, the, the publication name, and it will search the Web of Science and pull back the time cited count that you can put right into the database. And that can be run then dynamically. Every so often, you can update that with a new time cited count. So it allows you then to link from your database right into the Web of Science as well. So you can take advantage of the Web of Science data from any place in the university, and that's a key thing. Um, and then finally, um, just a word about XML. Our data, a lot of universities and governments use our research data as well. And what they do is they purchase the raw data, call it the raw data. But it's really not raw data because it is with all of the unification and everything that we've done with the data, but they get the entire data set. And then they load it locally and create a way for researchers to do research and for the ministry to do uh, academic uh, review through, for the web of science. <clears throat> so, so this very clearly is a way for, for a country. And we have uh, national, the, the REF in the UK is using the web of science data for, for the research excellence framework, the 2021 REF that's coming up. Australia uses it. Uh, we're working with about 60 government agencies that are using our data, and also important bibliometric partners, uh, partners around the world. CWTS uses our data for academic analysis of, of topical-based reports that they provide uh, for, for, for Europe as well. So it is something that it, it would afford you to do citation maps and to look up what's happening in various topical areas regionally as well. So, in summary, I'd just like to say that the Web of Science has a team that is committed to creating a resource that is modern and unique and provides unique content, high quality content, and allows you to search and use that content in unique ways. Um, we, we want to make the Web of Science, we want to work with academic institutions and become a partner uh, so that the Web of Science uh, is more dynamic, open and allows you to do what you need to do using our data. We're in the middle of an exciting transformation over the past two years, and we have a plan for the next couple of years that is being done today uh, over the next couple of months. So the Web of Science and related products uh, will always be at the forefront of research, the research ecosystem, because our, our aim is to produce tools that allow you to, uh, to, to do your work efficiently and effectively across all areas of the research and the flow. Um, and also, we have a team of people that are here today that uh, will design educational resources for you and to promote those, and we'll work with you so that we customize that, so that you're getting what you need to make, to make the best use of the Web of Science. We want it used by students, we want it used by researchers, faculty, the administration as well. So we can devise uh, uh, things that will help you at the university um, uh, do that. So, so Valentin and this group are here to talk about that and we'll, we'll always be a partner for you uh, in the future as well. So that's very good. Our goal then is to employ, uh, to increase literacy, information literacy at the universities so that you know the value of these resources and exactly what you can get from them. And we believe that the Web of Science, you know, it, it is used in 9,400 in international research universities and agency, government agencies all over the world. Uh, we aim to keep it there. So to do that, then we have to keep developing it and make it more modern and, and to, to add new features. Uh, to address workflow things and new types of content as well. So this is, if I'll end with a picture of our training platform, which is linked in the product, and then also Valentin and his group, they arena, they, they record things in local language as well, and we, we, we'd like to hear from you what you need as well, and we're here to help you. So I thank you very much for your time, and if you have any questions, um, uh, please don't hesitate to ask me.
Yes. Executive editor of semiconductor physics, quantum electronics, and doctor electronics, Petra Spartak. Uh, uh, let me know, please, what is the uh, relation between web of science and scopes, and what is the difference? Thank you. Okay. Well, there are foundational differences. The relationship is simply that we have no relationship. <laughs> and, and um, you know, um, they entered the market five years after we entered. The web of science came out. We we've been building our database for 55 years. You know, the, the Science Citation Index came out in 1960. So it's it's you know and we we and we work with academic institutions to, to create the data and the content and to index what was important for academic research. We did not the, the main difference we did not uh, you know on our platform we have a version of Medline. We have we have the patent literature in something called the Derwent Innovations Index. We have the data citation index data in separate resource that's up on our platform, because these are specialized content sources that have their own, their own bibliographic policy, and, and the data is different. So it's indexed a bit differently. We didn't throw all of that data together and, and say it was multidisciplinary. And that's what our competitor did. And they did a really good job. I'm not saying it's, not, it's a nice design, um, the, and, and, and you know they 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 did a good job, um, but I find and I don't have access to Scopus, but I have had access to it, and we and my fellow workers and the people working for me in North America and Europe have had access to it through uh, universities. Um, that when you get into it, there are roadblocks because of the bibliographic differences in the data, they didn't index all the data. They just threw what was indexed into a mix. So, for example, Medline didn't always index all the authors, all the, all the, the abstract and completely, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, uh, Compendex had a different bibliographic policy for, for, you know, picking up papers and what was important. It was important to electronics and electrical engineering, but it didn't cover, you know, it didn't connect to the other disciplines the way you can in the web of science because we do indexing. We're not pouring data into the platform. Um, indexing in, 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 for the web of science is, is unique. We still do it. I mean, we have automated ways that we do some of the indexing, but we're still indexing article by article. And we do over 2.3 million papers and records in any given year we're indexing. And, uh, and 80 some million some references. Those are all indexed. We have rules that were developed that change, but we have rules for you know, new types of references such as websites. Uh, so, so we have to keep updating what we're doing, but it's indexed. There's no automatic way we're pouring the data in. Um, we do, you know, and we're, we're part of the academic, Dr. Garford was always part of the academic research community. I mean, as I said, he had people coming in from all over the world to do research, to use our data to do research, and he had a relationship with academic research universities all over the world and was invited to speak at them and traveled extensively. The reason for that is because he was an academic. And this was developed for academics, not we we're certainly a commercial company, but the foundation of what we do is based on academic research, and that will never change. And today, you know, we're we're positioned uniquely because you know, you know, primary publishers that have a, a database like like our competitor, they're they you know when we develop the impact story algorithm, we refine the algorithm to. To, to identify the open, the, the legal open access papers in the web of science. Um, we had exclusivity for only six months, and then we gave that technology to the academic community and said, everyone is free to use it. 
I mean, that's just, that's different. Now, Elsevier didn't choose to uh, link to the green papers because, you know, because for obvious reasons, commercial reasons. So they, they, have, they have to think of things differently and what they're doing, but their, their MO, their, their, their objective is not to create an academic resource, uh, in my, my view. I mean, we could have thrown Medline today, we could increase our coverage by just putting Medline on the websites. We could put data citation index, we could put the patent literature in, and we would be much, much bigger than anything out there. But it would destroy the academic, the sense that we created of a balanced, multidisciplinary resource that where you can link from one thing to another, and there aren't any roadblocks. When I used Scopus, I would get into it in doing research, and suddenly I would not be able to link to a paper. And, and you don't have that in the web of science because we've done all the indexing. So I think that's one of the main differences. Obviously, they've created a, a, a very well-designed database. They have. And um, I think in some sense, it was a wonderful thing that happened for us as well because we had to do more. Suddenly, we had to do a lot more. And it became more exciting for us. And for me and for people working in, the, in, in this community, it became much more exciting for us because we, we were adding more to the database. We were new features, function, functionality. And our jobs became more exciting. <laughs> and I think it's, it's, you know, and we're moving forward now at a pace. We're going to have new releases of Web of Science monthly now. So, and not always big things, but every three months or so, there's going to be something major added to the Web of Science. Uh, we just did an update, and we're doing another one in the end of June. Um, and you'll soon get that author re redesigned author page that I was talking about, where every published author with an email address will be will be asked to create a profile so that everyone is getting an author identifier, a web of science researcher ID is what that's going to be. And invited, and you'll have a special, each author will have a special space where they can go in and annotate what they're doing, communicate with other people in their discipline. It, you'll still have that like you did in Researcher ID, but you'll also have the reviewers and universities that want to pull that data out en masse into a research management system or a repository can use an API just to do that. And each researcher gets a way to create a nice PDF from their profile of what they've been doing if they're, if they're going after a grant, if they're going. So, I, I mean, we're, we're trying to develop our platform in the sense that for all the different things that a, a, a researcher, you know, students, researchers, etc., what they need to do in their careers, what they do for day to day to make their day to day work more efficient. Thank you.